So uh, I'm Toby Moskowitz. I was a professor here for 17 years. Um, I was not a grad student here because I didn't get in. So, um, but uh, I would have been. Um, but I want to introduce, uh, I'll, I'll talk in just a minute. Um, to my left is Rob Vishney and uh, Dick Thaler. I don't know which one of you guys wanted to start. Dick, you want to go first? Age before beauty. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'd like to start with two uh, very old stories. Uh, the first is when I was writing those anomalies columns, um, <clears throat> I wrote one about mean reversion in the stock market and then I sent a draft of it to Gene. And uh, that was my common practice. I would send drafts to people who were in the literature. And Gene, this was when we were writing letters. Um, so Gene wrote back a letter, a very nice letter, uh, that ended with a sentence um, your work provides a useful contrast to that of efficient market zealots. So I was pleased to get the nice words and <laughs> surprised to hear that there were people that were efficient market zealots more than Gene. <laughs> and, uh, then I got here and I met the efficient market zealot uh, I don't know who you were referring to, but I met one. Uh, the, the, the second story uh, it, it takes place sometime in the mid-80s. I'm uh, giving a talk at the AM, AFA, AEA meetings. I was giving a, fine, a, a talk in, the, in an AFA session. And uh, I ran into Gary Becker in the hall uh, who I knew, and he, he said, well, why are you going into that finance session? Um, and I said, well, it's true I don't know anything about finance, but I'm catching up because they know less each year. <laughs> and I, I've, I've learned a little bit, but I think um, the trend is still working for me. <laughs> so let me talk about why I think that's true, is that um, we're smarter because we admit that we know less. Uh, and let me start with th theories. It, it's surprising. One name has not been mentioned. Well, uh, I wasn't here for Ken and Stu, so maybe it came up. But uh, that's Harry Markowitz. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I had to let a guy into the... Anyway, I'm s sorry for that. But um, so if we talk about theories, um, I think uh, his was kind of a, what I call a normative theory. And this is how rational agents should invest uh, in an efficient market. And um, I think that was a pretty good theory. Um, the CAPM, uh, my view, I know most of my finance colleagues disagree with me about this, but I view the CAPM as a theory that would be true in a rational world. So I, I think there is a world, maybe somewhere, maybe an AI world, where that's true. Uh, but um, as we know, there was a funeral conducted by Ken and Gene in the 1990s. So the, the one theory, I think, that has some underpinning um, is false. And in fact, now, we're told low beta stocks are actually attractive investments. Um, now, what about Arbitra's pricing theory? Um, you know, Gene always complains that behavioral has no discipline. Uh, I would say neither does rational asset pricing. Uh, we have lots and lots of factors and no theories. There's no, no reason to think that small firms or value firms or any of the other factors that have been proposed. There, there's no theory that said those are going to be the things that matter. 
So I think in terms of discipline, the two fields are equally undisciplined. And we don't have a correct theory of asset pricing. And it would, it would be nice to have one. Um, M and M. Well, I don't think even Mert believed in M and M. Uh, he, in, at this, the, you know, uh, George mentioned Einhorn and Hogarth. They organized a very influential conference here in Chicago in the uh, about 1985. Uh, there's a volume of the Journal of Business that's undoubtedly the best volume that journal ever published and uh, full of uh, papers by famous people, including Ken Arrow. Um, and Mert has a paper in there that's basically a long explanation for, yeah, firms pay dividends, and I don't know why they don't just repurchase shares. And um, so uh, Black Shoals, that seems to work. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> Uh, my, uh, I think the truest theory is Diamond Dibvig, uh, which was preempted by a movie, uh, but, in, but nevertheless, Silicon Valley Bank proved you were right. So, um, so there are some theories that are true, m mostly that one. Um, now, as far as what about facts, uh, in the survey paper that uh, Nick and I wrote, uh, we talked about two versions of the efficient market hypothesis, what we call the no free lunch and the price is right. And uh, Gene likes to only talk about the first one. Um, and I think the first one is more or less true. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's certainly would be good if we're talking about prescription, it would be good if individual investors thought that that was the world they were living in. Because um, when they don't, they typically get into trouble. And we know that uh, asset managers, um, you know, the best evidence is from Jensen, uh, who was a student here. And uh, I think every time that study gets replicated, it's more or less the same result. Um, and many people in this room wish it were less true, um, but um, now the price is right part. So when uh, we say, you know, the way Gene likes to put this is prices reflect all available information, to which I want to add one word, which is correctly. So uh, what, what Gene likes to do is switch that into an argument about whether you can beat the market. So if GameStop is selling for 100, um, we probably could take a vote and say, do we think it's too high or too low? And uh, it would be 99 to 1 in a certain direction. Does that mean that we want to go long or short? No. Uh, so yeah, yes, markets are hard to beat, but sometimes they can be very wrong. It's hard to show that. Uh, I think violations of the law of one price are the cleanest. So Owen and I wrote one of those papers, but uh, I, I, th I think that you know, the closed-end funds uh, was another example. More recently, AMC and APE. Um, so let, let me end with one other question about asset pricing, um, which is uh, a question about dumb money, which is the title of a recent movie. Um, in the old days, there was no dumb money. So if you picked up a finance textbook, maybe Stu's, um, it was smart people interacting in markets against, with other people who are smart. There, there were no dumb people. Um, then I think we moved 
to, okay, yes, there are dumb people, but the smart people set the prices. And I remember I was on a panel once with Fisher Black, and he said that. And I asked him, who is the smart money? And he said, Goldman Sachs, <laughs> which is where he was working. Um, so I, where are we now? I think the answer to those questions, is there dumb money and do they matter? Now the answer is yes and yes. Uh, we can't understand Bitcoin, I think you and I would agree. We can't understand Bitcoin in a world of fully rational investors. It does not mean that I can predict its price. Uh, Zwick and I used to have a standard uh, golf bet, which was one Bitcoin payable in 10 years, uh, which, uh, which we meant as a joke and a prediction. Um, but uh, let me end with, I think, the most important paper in all of finance over the last 40 years was uh, Limits to Arbitrage by the person sitting next to me and, uh, and Andre. Because I think that's the only lens we can use to make sense of everything I've just said. We, if there's smart money and dumb money, then what happens? So the answer is messy, and we don't know. And certainly the people who were shorting GameStop all the way up had a pretty rough ride. We've seen that movie before, um, going back to LTCM. And so we, which happened, what, a year or two after your paper? So their paper more or less predicted what would happen uh, to LTCM. I think that's the word we live in, um, and we have to understand that world better. <laughs> Professor Vishni. Um, so I find myself agreeing with Richard and Jean in that we don't know that much. I think it's pretty clear when uh, that there are a lot of things we want answers to, and. I share with Nick a certain youthful optimism about the possibility of doing more work to understand those things. Uh, so there I disagree with Gene, where it's like, okay, these are the facts and there's nothing more you can do with that. I think maybe we can think more and get better data about what's going on. Um, so, but we, all the open questions I'm gonna talk about, I'm just gonna mention four. Are, have to do with um, big things that I don't know, that I wish I knew. Uh, and the first one is understanding investor sentiment. And if you don't like that word investor sentiment, you'll see in a minute you can substitute uncertain expectations for future earnings growth and everything will pretty much be the same. I agree with Nick that we've got some nice models of behavioral biases that we can use to explain different anomalies in the market. Um, they're often backed up by survey or experimental evidence. But what I find lacking is the ability, and I think it may not be a surprise because it's a very hard problem, the ability to explain big shifts in investor sentiment or valuation dispersion after the fact. Forget about predicting, we can't predict. But after the fact, can't we do better explaining it? Richard Roll, of course, had wrote R squared in 1988, his presidential address, where he said, no matter how much data I bring to bear, I can't explain what's going on after the fact. I think that's a sad, a sad fact, and maybe he didn't use all the right information. I'm optimistic that maybe we can have more information. So I'm just gonna throw out some numbers as an example, recent numbers of things I'd like to understand. In 2022, QQQ, the large tech ETF, which everyone follows, is down a third, and it's up 40% in 2023. ARC, Kathy Wood, is a well-known mid-cap growth active ETF that hit its peak at 50 billion. It's well diversified. It's not all one company or one industry. Up 153% in 2020, down 23 and 21, down 67% in 22. And now dead cat bounce up 23 or 24 in uh, 23. 
So you lost 75 to 80 percent of your money investing in Kathy Wood at the wrong spot. Meanwhile, DFA small value up 2 percent in 2020 when ARC was up 153. These are both very well diversified portfolios. Up 40 percent in 2021 when ARC was down 23 percent. When ARC was down 67 percent, good old DFA small value, which I'm an investor in, is down 3 percent. But of course, this year when QQQ, the big tech is up 40, DFA up 2 percent. Okay, those kinds of value, valuation dispersions between well diversified portfolios, I would like to understand that. I'm calling it sentiment, but maybe there's a fundamental explanation. But let's not give up on trying to explain that kind of thing ex post. We can go back 20 years and see some similar things going on around the 2000 period. Um, so I don't think we've been very good at understanding. There have been some attempts at measurement. So you have the baker Wurgler Sentiment Index, which I think is a very admirable effort. They go back now like 50 years, 60 years, and try and construct what they mean by sentiment in terms of various measurable quantities. And they let you eyeball it and say, does this accord with what you think is going on in the market? And actually, probably the most promising thing there is valuation dispersion. They took look at dividend payers and non-dividend payers, and they look at differences in their market to book ratio. And they say when that thing gets very, very wide, that's what we mean by sentiment. Of course, you could equivalently say that's when there are incredibly high growth expectations for AI or the internet or whatever you're going to talk about. So you can give a fundamental uh, rendering of it also. But it would be nice if we had more than just that sort of measurement evaluation dispersion, if we had some understanding that went with it. If we had some of those overreaction and underreaction models to explain what data were people looking at in real time when we look after the fact, and why did they conclude what they concluded? And I guess I'm kind of behavioral because I think Bayes' rule should apply, and your posterior should only move with the precision of your information. And so up 153% and down 75 to 80, you'd need to know about the distant future pretty quickly in order to draw those conclusions. And that's why I'm always a little skeptical. Um, one more, a um, couple more open questions. Has there been a structural shift in the market? Okay, we've seen, Kent showed the data on the book to mar market to book going from 0.5 to 4. We know the world is different, the economy is different. Ken and Jean uh, show that um, the value effect has declined over time, but it's so noisy you can't conclude anything. And in particular, the second half, the last 25 years from 1998 to 2023, look to the naked eye to be much more volatile than the previous 40. If you look at DFA charts with all the bars, you can see just much bigger swings in the value growth relationship. Um, and so the world seems a little different than it was in terms of the volatility of the value growth relationship, or one might say the volatility of sentiment, uncertainty about the future. Why is this happening? Decline of institutional investors, maybe, and I'm not talking about Robin Hood, I'm just saying the death of defined benefit and the fact that it's a bunch of wealthy people working with their advisor deciding what to do without the discipline of rebalancing between value and growth. One theory, changes in the structure of information, social media, or you could take the explanation that Lubos and Pietro have, which is, you know, valuing uncertain technologies, you've just got more volatility. So you could tell a fundamental story. It looks pretty indistinguishable from sentiment. And the only thing I would say as a behavioral person is we need to know more about the information that was available at the time and why did they draw those conclusions and how do you go up 150% and then down 80 in a short period of time. You, you want to show me that information, but we don't have a good story in behavioral either for that, and that's, that's unfortunate. Um, along the lines of what Adair said, uh, you know, the positive aspect, not making mistakes. Are financial advisors potentially useful? And I think we've been too cynical, I mean, about that. I'm not talking about stock pickers. Forget about stock pickers. Just people who are advised on well-diversified portfolios and encouraged not to make tragic mistakes, like selling everything in March 2009 or March 2020. If somebody told you 
keep your allocation in stocks during that period, they would earn their half a percent fee many times over because you know, you've saved half your money. Uh, so the idea that you know, we wrote this money doctor's paper, we talk about holding people's hands, educating them, a situation of trust where people don't know the data, they don't know what to do. I'm optimistic that there's a role for that. Um, there's potential for abuse, we talk about that in the paper, and there's lots of data sets that show in certain situations people get taken advantage of. But I'm more optimistic. I think that there is some value to educating people about what we know and help keeping them a little more rational in their decision making so they don't make those impulsive decisions. Um, the only problem with that model, uh, the optimistic version of that model is it only works for wealthy people. Right? Those are the only situations in which the time is going to be worthwhile. That's where I think Richard's ideas about you know, libertarian paternalism and giving people, um, giving people tangible advice and remedies that they can follow, but often they're hard to follow without hand-holding, and only the wealthy can you know, really afford that hand-holding. But I would certainly recommend that my relatives hire a financial advisor if I was able to meet them and trust them, rather than ask me, that would be preferred. Uh, ask Doug. Yeah, ask, ask, ask Doug. So um, that, that, again, that's an open question. I think we don't know the answer about the potential and whether financial advisors are generally useful. I'll just throw in one more uh, open question on the international front. We haven't talked much about international. There's this huge anomaly which Gene has played a role in, which is, interest rate differences across countries. And the, I mean, right now, if you look, you get 200 basis points extra for investing in the US than in Germany. You get 350 to 400 over Japan and Switzerland. Those are enormous differences. People are killing for 10 basis points. And yet there are these three or 400 basis point differences. Gene showed back in like the late 70s, early 80s, that the exchange rates do not depreciate to compensate for the interest rate differentials it could go easily the other way. People come into dollar-based assets because the interest rate is high. That drives the dollar up further. There've been, there's been a lot of work on this, and this is a huge anomaly in fixed income that we really don't understand. Um, people are passing up big, big amounts of, of money by um, not investing in the higher interest rate countries, and the risk explanations haven't held up very well. Even the analyses that have been done by people who are fairly efficient markets oriented, they all refer to a peso problem. Okay, even though they have 40 years of data, it can be a peso problem, but you know, it could just be sleepy investors who have a home bias, who make the mistakes of thinking they can take this enormous risk in their equity portfolio, but no risk in their fixed income portfolio makes sense. And they're passing up huge sharp ratios. And these carry trades are much less correlated with the market. So you would be really diversifying and adding to, um, adding to the efficiency of your portfolio by doing that. So I think un in, in general, inter international finance is an underdeveloped research area. We should be doing more there. But we wanted to turn the tables on Toby and have him talk a little bit about what he thinks are the interesting questions. So uh, thanks. So I'm, I'm going to I'm going to do this in the context of um, I'm going to uh, talk about some open questions that I had, and actually Rob touched on a on, on a couple, um, and then see see how people respond, and, and then we'll open it up to, to Q and A. Um, let me, I'll, I'll even start with the last one that Rob mentioned. One thing I, that I was going to think about, but more as a challenge to behavioral finance was we have a lot of these anomalies that we talk about. You mentioned one, the carry trade, which works in fixed income, it works in currencies, works in commodities too. If you follow the um, uh, convenience curve, um, and actually Ralph and I wrote about that a long time ago, but you see momentum in all these markets, you see lots of the same phenomenon on all these markets, but we don't have good theories to explain why that persists. Now, the asset pricing theory says it should apply to all assets, but I don't think we have a great model that explains all that. But the behavioral stories, I think, mostly are typically about equities and predicting earnings and, and things of that nature. We don't have good models for thinking about why there's currency premium, right? Or why there's fixed income premium. So I think that's an, an open question and one that could be interesting. Um, secondly, I think we spend in behavioral finance a lot of time trying to predict prices. And I think it'd be interesting to see if we could do more predicting behavior, 
right? Uh, not just describing behavior, which I think we've done, but predicting behavior as well. And I think this, this comes back to some of the survey stuff that people have done. I think that's a, a very fruitful and interesting direction that's more descriptive rather than uh, um, predicting what will happen. But I also think there's lots of other things that we don't understand in financial markets, like why trading volume is so big, right? That's another quantity. I like some of the work that, that Ralph has done on, on the demand side, where he's capturing uh, quantities, a latent demand effect, but maybe we could tie that in to some behavioral phenomenon that would explain why we see the demand move around. Whether or not it has impact on prices, I think, is a secondary question, an interesting one, but we've sort of skipped that middle step, I think, to a large extent. Some of that's data-driven, but I think that's, a, that's an interesting area. Keep in mind, too, right, prices, by their very nature, are very noisy. It's going to be hard to explain. Seven, you know, I, I agree that those massive changes in valuation um, are, are going to be really difficult to explain. I think any model is going to have a difficult time explaining that. And maybe we shouldn't be. There's, there's, those are, that's, it's the order statistic, right? It's hard to explain those things. So, um, but I think it'd be interesting to kind of con connect those, those pieces. Um, so I think as we get more and more data on trading, I think some of the work that Barbara and Odin did was really interesting, but a very small subset of traders. Um, but we're getting more of this information. There's flows data out there. Um, there's a bunch of other quantities that, that, that uh, people can start to look at. I think tying, tying that down would be interesting. And that leads to another point that I think is also an interesting open question. We've heard this a couple of times from various people today, which is more structure. We know all models are false. We, we understand that. But structure allows us to estimate some things interestingly in the data that we, or as Gene put it, when we reject models, we learn something, right? So if we can, you know, in addition to pinning down moments that explain prices, if we're also simultaneously pinning down moments that explain behavior, whether that's trading, whether that's flows, whatever other quantities it is, I think that helps us learn something. And I think that would be interesting. Um, and then we could do all kinds of interesting things like Lars was talking about, thinking about how that dynamic changes when there's more or less uncertainty. That might actually lead to when, for instance, you might expect overreaction or underreaction. I just think, I don't know how to do any of this. I just think these are uh, interesting open questions that, that would be uh, neat to study. Um, so uh, structure, but incorporating some of, the, some of those uh, quantities would be, would be interesting as well. And then um, other sorts of um, non-price-based things we could look at, uh, which has been alluded to today, that I think can relate to behavioral finance are things like investment choice, labor choices, and also think it from the household perspective too. We, most of the household literature I think is about portfolio decisions, but there's a, there's a labor decision there too, and there's a bunch of other decisions that people make. And I don't know to what extent when we're making these decisions, the behavioral biases creep in or don't creep in or how we think about those things or, any, or how these interact, but I think there's, there's potentially um, a whole bunch of things that, that, that we could look at. Um, I want to make sure that there's time for, um, uh, I'm going to leave it at that. I have some questions if there aren't some from the audience, but let me open it up to the audience just because we have about uh, 14 minutes left. Um, and uh, anyway, thank you. So. Someone running a microphone over to David. David Robinson, uh, Duke. I was uh, lucky enough to be a PhD student here kind of during this period of tension that Nick described in the late 90s. And um, I can't remember whether Gene would say this critically or whether Dick would say this in jest, but one of the things that people said at the time was that in behavioral economics they were sort of looking for the keys under the lamppost. And at the time, um, I remember everybody was super excited about functional MRI scanners coming online and how that was going to allow us to get new data that was going to allow us to see inside people's brains and that was going to change the way we thought about some of these questions and there's certainly been many really interesting papers that have been written with MRI data but I think it's far from the case that we think we see inside people's brains as a result and that's a long wind up because, you know, if you think about the stuff that Dare was talking about, we are just completely awash in new types of data. 
And much of the data is what you would call kind of behavioral data. You know, it can read people's biometrics off their watches and stuff. I'm curious to hear you guys predict sort of like where data, uh, you know, where are there areas of new data that we haven't really been explored that have the potential to kind of crack some of these questions that, that persist? And which ones do you think, <laughs> if you want to go let further, me, which ones do you think will fail? Let me take the first stab at that. Uh, because I was short fMRI uh, technology. You can ask my friend Colin Kammerer about that. Uh, so uh, I think the most promising place for to be data hunting is inside firms. And the, some of this was covered in the previous panel. I think behavioral corporate should be like a giant growth field. I, the surveys that Cam and John uh, Duke and the, like the paper with Zahi about CFO overconfidence, their 80% confidence limits forecast for the S&P are right a third of the time. I think the stuff on hurdle rates that uh, uh, Gormson and uh, Tuber, Huber are doing. I mean, what what in the world are you guys teaching in corporate finance that would be telling them to use fifteen percent hurdle rates when you can borrow at two percent? So. Um, uh, 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 I didn't say today. <laughs> it, it, the, fu the weird thing about that data is the hurdle rate is always the same. <laughs> and uh, so uh, my friend Danny Kahneman had a theory about all of this. He calls bold forecast, timid choices. And to some extent, I think there's a, something of that going on that you have a high hurdle rate because you know the people pitching projects are lying. But uh, there's big cost to that because high hurdle re rates mean you're short-sighted. So uh, anyway, look, any you know, uh, Alex was mentioning some new kinds of data. I think we're not going to understand what's going on inside of firms until we get better data inside of firms. We're doing COVID February, yeah. Well, see, we always agree, Gene. <laughs> I have a question for both uh, Dick and Rob. Um, if we believe, and I'm with you 100%, that there is dumb money that uh, needs to be educated, why do we limit ourselves to some libertarian paternalism and we don't go more seriously individually and as an academic to say that is an outrage, we force people to basically invest in the stock market when they don't know what to do uh, and don't provide them a very simple pay-as-you-go system, pension system, that would not make you reach the finance uh, profession, but would certainly is a better way to fund retirement for people who are not in the business of being in the stock market, and uh, they only lose by being in the stock market. You I'm one. glad I wasn't asked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm glad no. you kept me out of it. <laughs> Yeah, how do you, why do you think that being in the stock market, I mean, if people are disciplined and they hold to their allocations and don't sell out at the wrong time, then it might be a good thing to allocate no, but something. You, you are saying that they need to be taught to be disciplined because they are, and then you need to pay hefty fees to a handholder that uh, a doctor, no, a I, psychological doctor. And when you can say them, if you invest in a pays you go, so if you have a pays you go system, you bet basically the real return on the economy for free without having a lot of. Uh, you uh, misunderstood my point. I think I said that wealthy people can afford to have quality people spend the time with them and the hourly rate to educate them and let them do what they want. People who have $100,000 to invest, you know, Fidelity will kick them out and won't even run their 401k. They're not going to get a good 
honest financial advisor to take 50 basis points of return to give them advice. That's why I endorsed some guidance that Richard had issued in the past. Because what do you do for people that can't afford that quality advice? You, you lobby for having a pension system that is different, that is not based on 401k for people who are below a certain threshold. Okay, That's a complete so waste of, so of, of societal resources. Social, Luigi, have you ever been to Europe? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I was at a, a conference on the uh, crisis in pensions in Spain last summer. And my advice was that they either need to have more sex or more immigrants. Because the birth rate, you need unprotected sex. All right. Uh, <laughs> um, right? I mean, the, there's no perfect answer. So look, the UK, uh, uh, introduced a new DC uh, pension scheme, and they used all of our tricks. They started at 1%, 3%, 5%, 8%. Opt-out rate is 10%. 97% are in the default investment vehicle, which is a diversified portfolio at low cost. That, you know, I'm not a legislature, neither is Rob. We don't get to make the rules. The only thing we can do is try to help make things better. And, um, and I think you have to do it with some humility because we don't know what the best system is. I mean, is a target date fund best? Almost certainly not. Is it better than what they were doing when they were trading on their own? Almost certainly, yes. I'm not qualified to speak on this topic, but I'm going to do so anyway. <laughs> when, when, when I get worried about the kinds of ups and downs that Rob has referred to, I go back and read Keynes's general theory on the stock market. And having had experience reading that, I blow by the stuff about the, about the beauty contest, which some people pick on to say that that just proves that investors are dumb or, or uh, gullible and read what he says about how difficult it is to value equities. Um, and his explanation, or at least his interpretation, of these sudden reversals or these periods of high volatility is that when investors get knocked off an equilibrium that they're used to, and they realize how difficult it is to value almost any company from scratch, there's a period of search, of ups and downs until they settle into a new consensus. So the real message of that is, of Keynes, is not to say that people are stupid, but that it is incredibly difficult to calculate fundamental value. And Fisher's, Fisher Black's uh, uh, AFA address on noise makes, in a way, the same, the same argument. The noise is so big and so pervasive that even people who try to be totally rational uh, find themselves in periods of disruption uh, at a loss to know what true fundamental value is. And that's what creates the space for all of these things you're worrying about. But uh, Keynes did not say that people were stupid. He just said they had a completely, a very, very difficult task in front of them sometimes. Uh, to, I'll just say one sentence, which uh, in the second and final edition of Nudge, we say more than once, we don't think people are stupid. We think the world is hard. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of dumb for us to talk about whether people are smart or dumb. People are people. And uh, all I try to do is make the world a little easier. 
Well, that's a shorter, shorter version of what I said, I guess. <laughs> yep. One more question. Yeah. Adair. Just really quickly, just despite what our panel works on, the conversation's only been pretty much on, until recently on the asset pricing side. I wanted to, to counter Toby's point on the, the household finance being about portfolio. I, I run the Summer Institute Household Finance. 200 papers, probably 150 are not on the, the every year, are not on the asset pricing side. And if you look at your assistant professors here, also more on understanding these other things that Dix, you've all worked on, and but you didn't talk about in your points about forward, right? And so just, just, just making the point that if we think about who we're talking about in the population, and we, we, you know, obviously the markets matter, but they matter for whom, where all the debt instruments that you're, you're system professors are talking about, or even the financial condition view of household finance and how behavior affects the overall financial condition, those things matter for everyone. And so just kind of wanted to draw that exception since you made that point about the portfolio. Sorry to be sound contrarian, but I just, no, just no, really, good. I mean, to the credit of the, the group here that you just have tremendous work coming out on financial condition through these other instruments. So congratulations to Chicago for that. The best part of that is it wasn't a question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no, Just perfect. No, it's we can end. It's right on time. No, if, uh, I, I, we're at, we're, that's time, right? That's what I thought. So I think we, we have a break. Is that right? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Rob and Dick. <laughs> No, that's me.